Hello, friends, and welcome to All Over the Place with Dara Star Tucker. I'm really glad to present an interview to you today that I did with a mutual of mine named Garrison Hayes. He's a filmmaker and a journalist. He does a lot of content that's very similar to mine. If you are not familiar with Garrison Hayes, I'm encouraging you now to go and find him on socials. He's under Garrison Hayes everywhere. He's a reporter with Mother Jones Magazine, and he also recently won a couple of awards, one of which was a Webby for Best Social Media Content Creator. Garrison has a very interesting and layered history, which gives him a unique perspective on so many different issues. It was hard for me not to make this an episode of me just gushing over Garrison and my love for his content. But I think when you take in some of his content, you will understand why. I'm getting the opportunity this summer to have a series of conversations. If you'll notice, I'm working in more of these conversations with various creators in different fields that I really admire and respect. People like Jamel Bowie, Kasim Rashid, Garrison Hayes. I'm reaching out to a few more people right now and have some potential interviews lined up that I think you're really going to enjoy. But these interviews give me the opportunity to both connect with fellow creators because a lot of the work that we do is very solitary. So at first it gives me the opportunity to connect with other creators that I respect. And then it also allows for the exchange of ideas and you all get to hear some of these issues discussed from a different perspective. So it's a win-win situation all around as far as I'm concerned. I'm coming off of a few weeks of travel. I did a creators conference in Washington, D.C., where I met up with Garrison, among many other fellow creators. The conference was called Trending Up, and it was geared towards people who do social justice oriented content. So that was a really cool opportunity to exchange ideas, to sit through panels, to meet a lot of the folks in person that I've been watching and learning from online for the last several years. I kept looking around and saying, wow, my For You page has come to life. So if you'd like to see a few clips of that event, you can go to any of my socials, Dara Star Tucker on all platforms, Dara Tucker B on Instagram, and you can see a little bit of the footage from the Trending Up conference. After that, I headed to Los Angeles to host a panel at a women's conference that was presented by Kate. KJLH. As you all know, these podcasts are being presented in cooperation with KJLH. There's a truncated version, a 25-minute version that appears on that station every Sunday night at 7 o'clock. And then I get to share the long-form version of that content with you all starting on Monday mornings. So that trip to Los Angeles right after the DC conference was a really cool opportunity to actually get to meet some of the listeners at KJLH in person and to have a really important conversation about maternal mortality. I was also able to meet up with a few family members and have some chicken on the beach. We had a really good time. And after that, I headed to Nashville, Tennessee to do a special appearance for the Sun Label Group. We did just a single song in Nashville to celebrate the relaunching of the Sun Label Group. So now the label that I'm with, which is called Green Hill Music, it's based in Nashville, Tennessee. Now it is going to be a subsidiary of the Sun Label Group. You may be familiar with that name because that was the Sam Phillips label that launched Elvis Presley's career. And Jerry Lee Lewis was a part of that label and B.B. King and so many others. So we got to go to Nashville and celebrate the relaunching of Sun Records. And of course, I've got photos and videos of that event posted online. And then finally, I headed to New York City to host the red carpet portion of the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund's annual gala and awards dinner. This year, they were honoring Tanya Lewis Lee and Spike Lee, who have done a lot of work in the social justice arena. I got to go out on the red carpet and interview people like John Batiste, Aloe Black. I even got to talk to Alfrey Woodard, who is a fellow Tulsa. I'm originally from Tulsa, Oklahoma. So we got to chat it up just a little bit about Greenwood and the Tulsa race massacre, that kind of thing. It was a real honor, particularly to meet Alfrey Woodard. I didn't get to talk to Spike Lee or his wife. They kind of came in late. Spike left early. But I did get a shot of Spike Lee's back as he was walking out of the door. That was my Spike Lee sighting. All in all, it was a pretty rigorous trip, but I got to meet up with lots of family and friends, fellow creators. I had a good time, but I'm looking forward to spending some time at home working on the breakdown, working on these podcast episodes, making some improvements to my home studio this summer, and hopefully enjoying the outdoors a little bit. So now I'm going to throw you over to this episode. I want to remind you, if you are enjoying the podcast, please give us a rating in the app. It really helps the podcast to be discovered by other folks. 
leave a review if at all possible. I got a review recently from someone who said that she listens to the podcast in her car with her children and they rewind segments and listen again and they have conversations and discuss this stuff. That warms my heart. That really fills me with a lot of joy. If you are having those types of experiences, if you want to help to boost the podcast in the search engine, take some time to rate the podcast and leave a short review if you can. The other way you can support us is by joining the Patreon. That's at patreon.com forward slash Star Tucker. You can support the podcast for as little as $5 a month. I love my patrons. I appreciate you all so much. You make what I do possible. So I'm going to send you on to this first episode with Garrison Hayes. We really got into a very deep discussion about content creation and storytelling from a Black perspective. When I have these types of interviews with people that I admire and respect so much, it's hard, first of all, not to fangirl out, but then it's hard to not have these personal conversations with them about the work that we do. I find this kind of conversation to be terribly interesting. There's a lot here that will help you as a listener to understand how to interact with the content that people like Garrison and me put out. I think it's really important not only to share knowledge, but to help people learn how to disseminate that knowledge. And so being able to observe conversations like this, I think allows people to become much more savvy in how to take in certain media. Media literacy is a passion of mine. So I hope you get something out of this conversation. I know I did. Part two, we're going to get into a conversation about Christianity and the Black church. But stay tuned now for part one with Garrison Hayes. Follow him on all social media if possible. And I look forward to seeing you next week. So that's this is what I love. One of the things that I love about what you do is just like, yes, apply. You apply a little bit of my thing yep. to stuff that I wouldn't apply my thing to. And that just is mind blowing for me. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. I, you know, I admire your work as well. And like, I think I've told you this a few times when I was scrolling TikTok, I've been record, I've been on TikTok for a couple of months and I've been recording all of my videos on my phone. I set it up and I get good lighting going and I'd have it like kind of like there, yeah. but it will still be on the phone. And then one day I scroll <laughs> And I come across a Dar Star Tucker video and you have like a camera and it's like slick and it's nicely edited. And I was like, you can do that here. That's crazy. That's insane. So you gave me permission to kind of bring my whole self to work, as they say. Like, yeah. that's the way I felt. I felt like, oh, I just got permission to kind of bring the full thing to yeah. work. And uh, so I appreciate you. I'm so glad. And of course, I've seen that type of content blow up. Um, since I started doing that, because I felt like I just was like, oh, I'm just an old person on TikTok because I just I'm doing the absolute most. And this is not really necessary. I'm bringing, you know, machine gun to a knife fight or something. I felt <laughs> kind of self-conscious, but it was like I can't say that it wasn't like an overcompensation. It was an overcompensation for being like, OK, I'm on this platform where people are doing like viral dances and stuff. And right. I can't really find myself in that. I had yep. put up some music stuff at one point and it was like, you know, it just did what it did. Um, but I was trying to figure out what my place was and slowly but surely it was like, OK, well, let me just let me just try this because I had already you know, been doing some some slight kind of documentary stuff yeah. on my own. I had been storytelling about my friends in Nashville and, and that kind of thing, musician friends and doing little um little pieces, packages on them just for fun. So I'm like, why not continue this over here? Especially when they opened up the, the time limit. It was, oh, that was my playground. It was just yeah, like, I'm yeah. ready. Let's roll. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. And and you're right. That influence is, is it goes beyond me. I've seen many people uh, adopt a, a higher quality, more uh, produced kind of aesthetic on yeah. platforms over the, over the years. Well, I'm glad we have been able to find our way there. I just saw today that the Senate passed the bill for the quote unquote TikTok ban, which is basically just a requirement that they sell to an American company. We don't really know how this is all going to end up, but it's interesting to be having this conversation with you on this day where the fate of the platform that gave us both um, kind of a launching point to be able to do what we're doing now. I mean, obviously you do a lot more in real life um, around video production and whatever content creation than what I do. Um, but I, I think that TikTok has been very much a game changer for you 
as it has been for me and so many others. Can you just talk about uh, what what TikTok has meant to you? Yeah, I, TikTok has been it, it literally has changed my, <laughs> my life. Yeah. I was not doing this before. Yeah. And though I have a degree in film and always wanted to be a filmmaker and make videos for a living, um, as many people who may listen or see this, listen to this or see this, know having a film degree does not mean that you're using wow. it. And TikTok <laughs> really gave me this platform um, to be able to use all of that and tell the kinds of stories that I want to tell. And it's it's been, it, TikTok has changed the world. I think that is undeniable mm -hmm. in the way that so many people who were living in obscurity before are now influencers and mm -hmm. have platforms. That said, you know, it is concerning to see TikTok go through all of this kind of uh all of this difficulty and 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 the house and the senate now passing bills to get it banned it's a it's a bit alarming for reasons that I think people like Khalil Green and others have explained very well that there is maybe a tinge of xenophobia present there uh, our data is insecure on American platforms, mm -hmm. that that there are a number of kind of somewhat hip hypocritical things at play. I, all of that to say, I've, I've spoken to lawmakers who have said, I have classified information that tells me this platform is dangerous. The way that it's being used is dangerous. And it's really difficult for me to ignore that little warning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, it seems as though TikTok, you know, ByteDance and TikTok will be protected potentially by the First Amendment. It, it seems that, that, that there may be a, kind of a, a, a judicial hurdle for this effort to ban TikTok to get over uh, that may stymie or, or prevent it from actually being banned. Um, but I will say that that data security is an important thing for us to keep in mind. And uh, I limit the uh, I, I limit TikTok's access to my location. I limit its access to my microphone and camera precisely because, and, I, and, I, and to be clear, I do the same for Facebook. I do the same for Twitter. I do the same for Instagram because I do think that data security is a real issue. And I think it's something that we should take seriously. This is the last thing I'll say about this. I think in many ways, America has always been uh, subservient to corporate interests and I am looking forward to a day when our lawmakers are strong enough <laughs> and courageous enough to stand up against corporate interests, not just in China, mm -hmm. but in America as well, to look out for consumers and everyday people because we are being exploited. Um, our data is being exploited by mm -hmm. American companies, and I imagine also by Chinese companies and maybe Indian companies and British companies and any any other company that that has access to our data. And so I'm looking forward to a more robust and a a more stringent um, a set of regulations that help protect everyday people from these corporate interests, mm -hmm. from these corporations' interests. Yeah. Well, thank you for that, Garrison. And I'm I'm actually going to back up at this point and do what I should have done at the beginning and actually introduce you to the people. I am talking today to one of my just absolute, I, I got to be very careful about talking about favorites. So I'm going to say one of my absolute favorites. Uh, he is so much more than a TikToker. He is an online uh, content creator, I guess, as a, just a general title for what he does. Um, but he's a, he's a real professional and he does this in real life. And he has brought some of what he does in real life to the online space and to social media. So Garrison was one of the first people that I noticed was doing some content that was similar to what I did and was just doing some very interesting and complex and nuanced storytelling on the TikTok platform. And of course, I follow him on every other platform at this point. Um, but he's just, he's one of those kind of groundbreakers. He's been in that space, I think, for at least a couple of years doing that um, on TikTok and bringing these little, kind of little, somebody called them TikTokumentaries, which I think is a cute name uh, for the type of content that we create. But he's been doing this probably close to as long as I have online and just talking about issues of race and culture. Um, 
and doing it from a perspective that I don't do it from, which is the other thing that I love about him. He does something similar to what I do, but it's his own version of that. I hate to even be reductive in that way because that's he's he's much more than, than that. So Garrison, just tell us from your perspective about what it is that you do, how when people ask what you do uh, online and off, how do you describe that to them? Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you, Dara. I am making videos on the internet that I see is kind of, to your point, mini documentaries. I'm mostly talking about history and tying that history to the present. Um, I really do believe that the past helps us understand the present just a little bit better so that we can build a better future. Mm -hmm. And that's what I set out to do. When I, when I jumped on TikTok in January of 2021, I was trying to help uh, situate that moment, whether it be the summer of 2020 and the racial reckoning that we'd just gone through six months uh, before or January 6th. I was, I was really hoping to situate um, our present time in its historical context, um, mm -hmm. mainly because I thought that a lot of our racial justice conversation, the discourse was really just bereft of that historical yes. um, context and, 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 and instruction. And so that's what I do. I, I talk about those things online and I try to do so in ways that keep people engaged. And I am a visual storyteller. I'm a documentarian. I'm a filmmaker. And so in many ways, what I'm trying to do is, is bring in those elements of documentary filmmaking and narrative filmmaking into the social media kind of space and, and do so in a way that, that keeps people watching and hopefully sharing. Mm -hmm. Well, you do it so well, uh, Garrison. And we we found out once we became mutuals online that we lived in the same city. I don't know how long you have lived. How long have you lived in, in Nashville? Yeah, I've been in Nashville since uh, summer 2021. So about June, May, June 2021. I moved okay, down here. So from wait, you, moved, you moved to Nashville after I left because I left okay. in the beginning of 2020, right before the pandemic was when I okay. left Nashville. Yep. So we never actually lived in Nashville at the same okay. time. I don't think I realized that. So that makes a little more sense that we yep. never crossed paths with each other um, at the time. But it's kind of cool that you're there because there have been a couple of occasions where we've been able to meet when I've visited Nashville again. And I'm hoping to do more work with you in the future, Garrison. Um, Garrison stays so busy. So I'm really appreciative for you making the time to have a conversation with us today. I follow Garrison on all platforms, as I said, but I think Garrison really shines, his, his content really shines on YouTube because he, he really is a true filmmaker. And I think YouTube really allows him to stretch his, uh, to spread his wings and to really stretch out and tell some very nuanced, just interesting stories. And what would you say the, the average length of the videos that you do on YouTube are? Yeah, on average, they're probably anywhere between nine and 12 minutes, somewhere okay. in there. Yep. Okay. Yeah, because I, I follow some creators like a guy named FD Signifier, a woman named Be Kind Rewind, and some others that I follow that do some wonderful storytelling or commentary, really like video essay type stuff. And their videos can, I mean, sometimes can be 30, 45 minutes. FD Signifier, I've seen videos of his that were almost, you know, movie length, or they were movie length. Um, but for the type of work that both you and I do, where it's, you know, very much like lots of visuals, this stuff takes a lot of time yeah. to produce. I mean, you just talked to me uh, before we started recording about a video that you've been working on for how long? Yeah, for about a month and a half. Yeah. yeah. And that's that's not unusual um, for uh, the kind of complex storytelling that you're doing. So a nine or 10 minute video that may represent weeks of work uh, for yeah. both of us. So, but one of the videos that I ran across recently that just every time I, I don't know, every time I sit with one of your videos, I, I just apologize in advance for all the gushing. I'm just <laughs> such a fangirl um, of your work and of your perspective. It's just like, it's one thing to have the camera. It's one thing to uh, to have gone to film school, which I never did. I'm just, you know, totally like ragtag, self-taught. And you'll see the roughness in what I do versus the slickness of what Garrison does. But it's one thing to have the equipment. It's one thing to know by rote the things that you should do to put a story together. It's another thing to really have, to truly have a perspective and a point of view and to have something to say. And I think that's the thing I notice with storytellers across 
all disciplines. I mean, I think of someone like Stephen Sondheim, who is, you know, Stevie Wonder, whatever, some of my favorite writers. Um, if you're a great writer, you can learn how to turn a phrase and you can learn how to put words together in a way that feels interesting. But having a perspective, having a philosophy, having a point of view is something that cannot be taught. So I guess, where would you say, first of all, that your your perspective and that depth and that richness of being able to um, approach the world from a unique standpoint and ask the questions that you ask that help you to tell the stories. Where did that come from? What's what, how, did, I know that's a big question, but like what, what went into uh, creating uh, your, your point of view and your perspective? Yeah, I think I would have to, to give all of the compliments and all of that credit to my, to my family. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking about my Nana, my grandmother, who has always been a storyteller in my mm -hmm. life, telling me stories from her childhood and young adulthood and, and her life, um, which I think cultivated in me a desire to also tell stories with the same um, amount of engagement and vigor. Mm -hmm. And like, I'm locked in, you know, mm -hmm. even if she's told the story <laughs> as grandmothers do 300 times, <laughs> right. I'm still like that little detail. I can't wait to get that detail yeah. again. Yeah. And she puts the, bucket on the man's head and bangs <laughs> like I, I can't wait for that right and so I give her credit for that kind of love of storytelling um I think m both of my parents my mom and my dad my dad passed away in 2021 um and I think about them as these two very intellectually honest people they are mm -hmm. just honest they have to they've always had to be themselves and have they've always had to be truthful mm -hmm. and they also raised me I grew up in Atlanta and the beautiful thing about growing up in Atlanta in the 90s and, and, and 2000s when I was growing up is that it was this, it felt like this place of profound Black pride. I, I grew up right down the street from Morehouse College mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, Clark Atlanta and Morris mm -hmm. Brown. And so there's all of this education around me. There's all of this pride. And, and, and from as early as I can remember, there have I've always known that black people are capable mm. and black people are not what we are depicted as on mm -hmm. certain types of TV. I've always known that inherently because mm. I've known these people in my life. And so when I grow up and I become a man and I enter the world and I see that people don't look at me with that same d level of dignity that I yeah. was raised to believe that I had and deserve yeah. to, to walk around with, um, that began to become that that became a really important part of my storytelling and mm -hmm. the way I communicate and move in the world is helping to hopefully reorient the way that folks see themselves, black people particularly see themselves, mm -hmm. and to a degree the way that others may see and understand us. And I and I and as I've said, I think that history is one of the best ways to do that is to mm -hmm. say, wait, 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 this is the narrative about who we are and what we are, but the mm -hmm. historical record says otherwise, right? And mm -hmm. and so being able to kind of like have that, that is, I think, at, at my core, I think that's probably the perspective that I hold most dearly, which is that um, humans deserve to be seen and viewed and 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 <laughs> depicted with the, the truth of their dignity and and beauty. And, and so that is what, that perspective you're describing, that's what's kind of at the core of, mm -hmm. of my work. I think that's probably why I identify so deeply with what you do. And I think a lot of people do, regardless of where they come from, because you are just an excellent storyteller, period. But I think I hear a lot of my own upbringing in, uh, you know, in, in your description of how you grew up. Although I think we there were some really important differences. Um, I remember talking to you about this on one of my visits to Nashville. And you talked about how um, what a strong sense of your own blackness that you received from your upbringing. And I don't know that 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 I can say that I have a similar story. A lot of where I come from and I my uh, the impetus for me starting to create the content that I did right around the time that you did. I mean, I started a little bit before you did. But as far as like serious content creation, yeah, it was early 2021. It was January 6th. It was right after the election. It was like there was this cauldron that was bubbling up yep. inside. And I felt like we had, we're not seeing this through a his, an historical lens. There needs to be much more context that helps us to understand how we got here. How did we get here? 
And there was just a lot of ignorance that I saw that was just floating up to the surface. It was okay. All right. If we have people that care about educating themselves around these topics, I want to make myself available. And I want to learn. That was my attitude. I want to understand more deeply how we got here, how I am processing through how we how we got here and what I'm looking at, um, because it's causing me to question a lot of things about the country that I grew up in. And so the way that my upbringing kind of differed from yours, I think, was that I grew up in a very um, it, it was a very mixed world at times. But I grew up at, at certain times around a lot of white folks mm -hmm. and with a lot of the respectability politics, a lot of that. We have to be the good black people. We have to be a credit to our race. We have to make sure that they know that we are not we're not those kind. You know, we're we're well behaved and we're going to toe the line and we're going to make them feel good and we're going to make them feel comfortable about who they are. And, you know, I, I wouldn't say it was necessarily I did not grow up in a, 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 a terribly political household. So it was never about uh, flag waving or or supporting republicanism or, you know, the, the Tim Scott, Candace Owens types. It was never about being a sellout. But it was about kind of placating a certain uh, version of, um, I don't want to say, because you hear this word divisiveness thrown around a lot, you know, and you it's all about unity, 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 unity. And if you have anything to say about race or you're troubling the waters at all, that's one of the first accusations that comes from the types of people that I grew up with. We need to be in unity. And so the type of work that I do is not very well received or respected by the kind of people that I grew up with. And I think that probably is the fundamental difference in how you grew up versus how I grew up. You grew up, it seems to me, in, a, in, a, in an environment that really affirmed and encouraged who you were as, as a Black man. And so how, I guess, my question you know, understanding that I think I'm correct in assessing that about your upbringing, because we have talked about this before. Mm -hmm. um, but what would you say? And this is maybe a s slightly strange question. But what is your relationship um, to whiteness? What is you what do you feel is your responsibility in terms of communicating your message to to white people versus I am a black man. I'm standing in the place that I am. I'm representing what I represent. You can receive this or not, but I want to affirm to black people, like you said, who we are, the value, the beauty, the joy, all of those things that I don't see represented in the media. How, how would you describe your relationship to uh, communities outside of your own in terms of your messaging? Yeah, I mean, the truth is I have a lot of I have a number of white followers and people who follow my work, who, who identify or are white. And and that's great. That 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 is that's wonderful mm -hmm. uh, for me. I've always said this that my the content I make is for Black people. Mm. I think at the 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 primary audience I am writing to, even when I'm talking about white people, mm. is actually Black people. That is so interesting. <laughs> that is, that's who's in my mind, <laughs> and it's it's that way. And I'll tell you why. I so I so I grew up in Atlanta. I didn't know any. I didn't know white people like for real. Like mm. I may I can think of maybe two that I knew <laughs> up until I was maybe eighteen or nineteen. Right, two. Yeah. And <laughs> so in Atlanta, I didn't know. We, we live in a, in a profoundly segregated uh, world mm. and, and 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 country specifically. And so. Uh, I didn't know white people. Then I went off to my conservative Christian, uh, predominantly white university. And mm -hmm. I suddenly knew a lot of white people. <laughs> I knew mostly white people suddenly. <laughs> and it was really an interesting paradigm shift for me. I had to, it was culture shock in many ways. I had to learn a lot of different things. I, I mourn the ways that I changed myself to fit within mm. that environment. Mm -hmm. And what I quickly realized is that I was becoming the person who was the spokesperson, to your point. I was, I was the right. spokesperson for Black students for black on people. campus. I was the <laughs> spokesperson for Black people in the world. Wow. Like, I'm every, I, I'm every Black one. Yeah. It's all in me. I'm, that's me, right? And suddenly... <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly. You're a representative of the blacks. Okay. I I the delegation of blacks represented by me. And it was wow. crazy. It was I'm curious, insane. What university did you go to? 
I went to Southern Adventist University. It's in Collegedale, Tennessee. It's a Seventh Day Adventist um, small Christian mm -hmm. uh, school. About three thousand students when I was there, and so okay, you know, <laughs> very and I modest. Went to, and I went to Oral Roberts University in Tulsa, and it had about the same. I mean, maybe five thousand students, and yep. so yeah, just noticing a lot of similarities there. But there, the continue. similarities are there, <laughs> and, and so I, I think a couple of things that I, that that I learned during those years was that there are so many people who are put in position to be the spokesperson. Like, like if you are black in a white space, you are almost automatically kind of, you know, conscribed, like, like co-opted mm -hmm. and forced to be the spokesperson. And in many ways, people don't have the time. It's a, it, it's, it's an inconvenience to have to go and try to learn all the best ways to communicate this stuff. Like, mm -hmm. like I have to be a DEI professional. I have to be a history <laughs> teacher. I have to be a counselor. I have to be, I have to be all of this stuff in this moment. This is insane, right? Yeah. Like that is too much pressure. And so when I say that, even when I'm talking about racism or anti-racism, my audience or my intended audience or the person that I'm speaking to is a black person that's watching is because I'm really trying to speak to a person who knows that racism is real, knows that it's kind of an issue and 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 needs to be dealt with in today's times, but they don't have the language mm -hmm. to articulate that, right? Mm -hmm. Like they don't know how to articulate their point. They don't know how to fully kind of like synthesize these ideas in a way that allows them to stand confidently in what they believe and why they believe what they believe. And if that means communicating it to someone else, then so be it. But but mostly my, my work is to give language uh, to when I'm talking about those things. I'm really just trying to give language to black folks who know these things exist, but mm. don't really know how to articulate it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what I'm kind of doing the more kind of teaching on like anti-racism and history stuff. When I'm when I'm actually telling historical stories, again, it's really about black dignity for me. It's like, how can I make sure that black people know? Like, I don't my biggest, like, how do I say this? The thing that I I I mourn the most is that some black folks are walking around with anti-blackness. Uh, inside of them, yeah. they're walking around with these these destructive ideas mm -hmm. about themselves, precisely because the American educational system, our media infrastructure, and the books that are put before us do not center the brilliance, the beauty, the complexity, mm -hmm. the dynamism of blackness. And what I want to do is present stories that allow black folks to really believe like man i we are what we are like mm -hmm. we are this thing that i knew we were but i was never taught that we were um and and if white people hear that and enjoy that and learn something from that then great you know <laughs> wonderful <laughs> wonderful man wow like that's a how blessing how nice for you that's so i love that for you <laughs> i love you that i love <laughs> that and that's the thing. This is the last thing I'll kind of say about it, you know, before I kick it back over to you, Tara. Like, I know that, you know, I've been told a few times, like, the way you communicate is just easy for, like, a white person will say this to me. Like, I'm just, I, I just think it's, like, easy for me to understand. Mm. And that's great. That's mm -hmm. great, too. Like, I I don't, I don't have anything against white individuals. I, I have, my, my problem is with white supremacy. Yeah. And, and and so, you know, some people hold that so dearly that they think I have a problem with white people. Mm -hmm. I don't. And so, like, if white people are benefiting from the work that I do, I think I hope that the world is a better place as a result of it. That's that's great for me. I think that's a really important distinction uh, there between our approaches. And it's one of the reasons that I really love uh, listening to you, because your approach is clearly a little bit different. There's there's a tweak that is really important that's there. I never get the feeling that your content comes off as acerbic or uh, overly confrontational. As a matter of fact, I feel like my content sometimes can be a lot more confrontational. And there will be times where I'm just like, even we talked about uh, offline before we started the interview, a video that you recently did on uh, a trope called the magical Negro that that is used oftentimes in film and in television. And I said to you at the end of the video, I was like, well, I was kind of waiting for you to kind of do this hard hitting like, hey, and this is what I think of it. And this is where we should land with it or whatever. And you did not offer that necessarily. I mean, I know what I would have done with it, but I think sometimes <laughs> you are uh, kinder 
um, than than I am. And that may have something to do also with your perspective, as you said, considering um, the, the audience that you feel that you are fundamentally speaking to. If I feel, as I do, that my job is to be much more of a bridge, I have always fulfilled that role. I have always been in environments where I had to learn how to communicate with white folks from as early as I can remember my earliest memories. You know, we went to a predominantly white Christian school. We went to a church that actually was fairly mixed for the type of evangelical environment that I was brought up in because they brought my father in as the music minister Mm -hmm. and the pastor at least had the presence of mind to say, hey, I want some black music in my church. Mm -hmm. So because my father was there, his presence drew um, a significant number of black people. So we had a, a much higher a uh, population of black people in our church than most of those churches had at the time. And this was in the eighties. Um, so I grew up in a much more mixed environment than I probably should have simply by virtue of the fact that my family was there and we were the ones drawing the black people in that came. Uh, but there has never been a time in my life where I have not had to uh, carry the burden, I would say, of, of learning how to communicate with white people and learning how to explain my culture to them or learning how to acquiesce, or learning how to code switch, or make things more palatable for them. And so every video that I make, that I produce, is made with them in mind. And I don't necessarily think, and I think about this stuff often, and I have to from the perspective of storytelling. Who am I talking to? That's one of the first questions as a storyteller that we should, that we should be asking. Who's my audience? Who am I speaking to right now? Mm -hmm. And I understand um, that a lot of what I'm doing because of uh, the, you know, for the same reason that you mentioned, just all of the the upheaval that happened in 2020 and 2021, uh, the the very thing that caused me to start speaking out in the first place, I had to ask myself, well, who am I speaking to? If I'm speaking out, who is it that I would like to hear me? And what do Mm -hmm. I want them to hear? Well, I want these white folks that maybe empathize with the January 6th rioters or who maybe have voted for people like Trump, but maybe feel some trepidation about that and who understand, as you said, that there is a problem with race. I'm not speaking to neo-Nazis. I'm not speaking to avowed white supremacists. I'm not speaking to people who have no desire to hear what I'm saying. I'm speaking to people like the folks I grew up with who knew black people who loved me. Oh, my father's name was Doyle and my mother's name was Linda. Oh, brother Doyle, sister Linda. Oh, we love you guys. Oh, you're just, you know, they might as well have been saying, you're, 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 you're the good ones. We love you. Right. Right. You know, I'm speaking to those people like, Hey, you love us. You care about us. This is what we're going through. This is, this is the reality of, of, you know, what we face in the world. These are the ways in which we worked over time to make your lives easier, to make your reality more palatable, to make sure that you didn't have to see what we were really going through behind the scenes. And it's very interesting because there was a video that a dude put out yesterday or the day before on TikTok, uh, basically saying, hey, Gen Xers, why are you so angry? Why are you so upset? Why are you so black Gen Xers? And it was one of these, you know, bombastic things that was clearly meant to um, stir people up, to poke the Mm -hmm. bear, to get views. And I wanted to do a response to it. And I just decided not to give the guy any um, any more gas. Mm -hmm. I may end up doing a video that generally responds to that question um, from a sincere point of view. But I I just I didn't want to give that dude any more exposure than what he you know already had from asking such a ridiculous question. But his his statement was pretty much, hey, everything was fine when we were growing up. You know, we were the white kids. We were listening to hip hop. You know, I had other black friends that, you know, hung out with me and we were just all listening to the same music and we got along fine. There were no problems between us. What's what's the big deal? Why are you guys all of a sudden talking about uh, white supremacy and systemic racism? Mm-hmm. And, you know, those are the types of people that I, I the folks that would ask that question in sincerity are the kinds of people um other than my own people, other than black people, those are the types of people that I feel that my um, that my content 
is uh, being created for. So I guess if you were to answer that question, Garrison, what's what's the deal? What's it? You you got you all seemed fine when you when we went to college together, Garrison. You seemed fine. You were like such a, a congenial guy, and you seemed very nice, and everything was everything seemed cool between us. Why are you out here making all this content? about race and, and, and stirring the pot. Why, why are you doing this? Everything seemed okay before. You know, it's so funny to me that talking about white people, white people are like, like, it's almost as though they get the same script from like, mm. like it's like they get a script from headquarters and they like, they get the script from headquarters <laughs> and then they like repeat it. You know what I mean? I, I can't tell you, Dar, how many times I've gotten that. Like, <laughs> I've gotten that comment. I've gotten that remark. I went back to my alma mater. And I guess at this point, people now know exactly where I went and who I could be talking about. So I'll try to be a little, <laughs> I'll try to disguise the identity uh, to protect the guilty. But, you know, I was asked like, you know, exactly that question. When you were here, you were student body president and you were, you know, you were th all of these kinds of mm -hmm statements that at their core are really saying you i felt comfortable and mm -hmm. now i don't feel comfortable yes. you were a good one and yes. now you're a bad one <laughs> and and so you know i think there is a a few different answers i can give to that I, i'll say i'll speak personally when i got to college i got there in 2009 and this we're coming off of the high of the election of the mm -hmm. first black president mm -hmm. i'm a relatively, and I do mean relatively, there are people who are far more articulate than me. But for these white folks, I was a, one of the first black <laughs> art, articulate black people they'd ever known. Like they, and so that means I'm compared to only one other person. <laughs> it's me Barack. and it's Barack Obama. Those are the two. It's, it's Garrison and Barack. Those, they, they might as well be the same guy. So I'm Barack of campus. <laughs> Well, we're going to have to leave it there for now, folks. I'm looking forward to sharing parts two and three of this conversation with you in the coming weeks with the wonderful Mr. Garrison Hayes. We're going to get into some discussion of black folks and the Christian church. Why do black people continue to dedicate themselves and invest in the Christian church as much as we do? Historically, we represent a very large portion of the Christian church. So why? Garrison has made some really interesting content around that question. So I'm looking forward to getting into that part of the discussion with him. And then we share a bit of our own journey through the deconstruction process, asking questions about where we are spiritually and finding our own path and walking in truth. It got pretty deep and I love these types of discussions. They are my favorite kind of conversations to have. And so I'm really happy to be able to share them with you. Come back next week for part two of the discussion between Garrison Hayes and I. In the meantime, follow Garrison Hayes online. He's on all platforms under Garrison Hayes. He's on YouTube, Instagram, Threads, TikTok, wherever you are, Garrison is there. I'm going to have part two of this discussion for you next week. Looking forward to sharing it with you. Until then, let's learn to shout.